So turn in your Bibles with me to Ezekiel chapter 37 and verse 1. Ezekiel 37 and verse 1. So Ezekiel, the prophet of God, says this. The hand of the Lord was heavy on me. I don't want to play games today. Have you experienced the hand of the Lord on you? Have you experienced the presence of the Lord so strong that you feel it? And I kind of struggle to describe it because it is a heaviness in the, in, in the way that you can actually feel His presence, but it's not a heaviness as in sadness. It's not a heaviness that's a bad thing. It is a good heaviness where you feel the weightiness of the presence of God. We kind of talked a little bit about the glory of God last week. How many of you would like the hand of the Lord to be on you? Why don't we just stop and pray right now? Lord Jesus, we hear your scripture and even from the very beginning, our heart begins to yearn because we want to sense your presence on our life. Lord, we want your hand to be on us in such a way that we sense the weightiness of who you are and the plans that you have for us. And so from the very beginning, we stop and ask, Lord, place your hand upon us. Speak to us. Amen. He said, the hand of the Lord was on me and he brought me out by the spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. And it was full of bones. So he brought me out by what? By the Spirit. Right? So Ezekiel is being Spirit-led some by, somewhere. Right? But how about you on a level where you are? Do you desire to be led by the Spirit? I mean, how many of you have had those God moments where God speaks to you to do something? Maybe it's something simple to go up to somebody and say, hi, Anna, how you doing? And then Anna begins to open up and share what's going on in her life, and all of a sudden, boom, you know it's a God moment. Maybe God has used you to say, hey, that person over there, I want you to go and give a $5 bill to them. And you're like, I really want this $5 bill, God. But you go in obedience, and you give, and it opens up something that you never dreamed of before. That's what it's like to be spirit-led. Sometimes God leads you to speak a word to somebody. Sometimes an action. Do you want to be spirit-led? If you do, let's stop and pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your presence. Lord, we desire for your hand to be on us, but we don't want it just to stop there. We want to be led by your spirit. Lord, there are so many needy people all around us And I believe firmly that you have all that they need. And Lord, you desire to use us. So we stop, we open our ears, Lord, and we listen for the voice of your Spirit. Lord, I pray that this week you would give us divine encounters, Lord, where you show us who we're supposed to talk to, what we're supposed to do. And Lord, something amazing happens because we're being led by you. Do you believe that? Say amen if you want that. Amen. So the hand of the Lord was on Ezekiel. He brought him out by the Spirit of the Lord and set him in the middle of a valley. So picture it in your mind. You've got the mountains on the side, and now he is in the valley, except this is a valley that is full of bones. And he led me back and forth among them. So I want you to, to stop for a minute, and I want you to be... Ezekiel, let's, and I know it was bigger than this, but let's pretend that this is the valley, every square inch in here, and you see bones everywhere throughout this place. So there's this battle that took place, and this is all left from bones. All that's left is bones. Now I want you to use your senses just for a moment. What does it smell like? Maybe musty? I don't know. What do you see? You don't see this nice skeleton laying here. What do you see? Animals come. You might have a skull over here, an arm over here, a foot over here. So these bodies are strewn 
in different places, bones not connected with one another. That's what you see. What do you feel? You begin to walk back and forth. It's not easy to walk back and forth. Why? Bones aren't level. You've got a skull here. You've got bone there. So you're, he's with the sandals trying to walk and steady himself as he walks. He's got sandals on. So what's going in between his toes? Pieces of bone, dust that are there. Now, you've got to put yourself in Ezekiel's spot. If you didn't know, Ezekiel was a priest. Did you hear me? He was a priest, and a priest couldn't touch an unclean uh, a bone because at that point he would be unclean. Right? So at the, the age of 30, he was supposed to start his priesthood, but he is not in his homeland. He is with Daniel, Hananiah, Azariah, Mishael in a foreign land in Babylon. And so here he is, he's walking among things that defile him. Now for us, it would be pretty gross to walk through bones, but imagine for a priest to walk through these bones. As he's walking, what does he hear? Some crunching, the hollow sound of bones all around him. And God doesn't have him just look, he has him walk through these bones. I don't know how long it took, but he walked in and around and among them. Everyone, just imagine the, the, the crunching, the smells, all of this, and he takes all of this in. And he notices that the bones were very dry, brittle to the point that they were probably breaking as he stepped on them. And then God, in the midst of all of this, says something to him. Son of man, can these bones live? Now, Ezekiel, in the natural, is looking at that and is saying, well, no way. Now, you look at this and you know what happens, right? So you're like, sure, yeah, yeah. Let me help you get there. Okay, let's imagine you're in New York City. How many of you have been to New York City before? Okay, you're there and you hear around the corner some yelling, okay? Okay. And so you rush to the scene and you find eight people surrounding this body that is lifeless. It is not moving. Uh, maybe they fell. Maybe something happened. What do you do in that moment? Well, if you know CPR, you might begin, you know, you check for pulse. There's no pulse. And you begin to do compressions trying to bring that person back to life. You might even do mouth-to-mouth resuscitation to bring this person back to life. Now, let's go back to the same scene. Let's rewind. You hear the people screaming. You go, and there's eight people around. Instead, in the middle, there is a skull here, an arm there, a piece of a a toe over here, and over here. And they look at you and say, Help him! Help him! Are you going to get down on those ribs and begin to push? Are you going to put your mouth on that skull and begin to breathe life into that skull? No, it's dead. Man, there's not even any meat inside of the bones. It's completely dead. Maybe you can understand how Ezekiel is feeling in this moment. He sees all of these dead bones and his head, his intellect shouts, there is no way. But yet, who asked him? God. And he remembers, yeah, God is the one who spoke into the darkness, nothingness, and created everything that there is. Yeah, I remember that time. It wasn't too long ago, you know, that Elisha the prophet, he died. He was in his tomb. And then later there was this guy who died in the battle and there was this rushing scene. And they took and they threw his body in there. And all of a sudden when it touched the bones of Elisha, it came back to life just like that. And That God, that God can do anything. So he thinks, and he says the most intelligent thing I think he could say in the moment, and it's this. Sovereign Lord, you alone know. I don't know. This is a trick question, God. This is up to you. You know if these bones can live or not. We're going to stop in this message just for a moment. 
And when we look at the scripture today, we're going to look at in three different lens. One lens is this was given at a specific time to a specific people for a specific reason. That's our first place, our strongest place that we emphasize the scripture. Second lens that we're going to look through is, is there anything from this story that we can glean for the church of today? The whole church, not just our church, but the whole church. Is there anything that we can glean from this? And then we're going to look lastly through the lens of, hey, what about you? What about, what about Laura? What about Meredith? Is there anything that she can glean, any universal truth from there that she can apply to her life? So as we look at this story, we're going to look through those three lens. Now let's continue on. He says, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, prophesy to those bones. What does that word prophesy mean? Some people believe, or, you know, this is a, an acceptable definition, to foretell of the future. That is one definition of prophesy. The second definition is to speak or sing under the inspiration of the Lord. Okay? God is upon you and you speak. God is upon you and you sing out something from him. Now, in this instance, he's not foretelling. He is simply speaking what the Holy Spirit gives him to speak. So God is commanding him to prophesy to these bones. How dumb is that? In the natural, that's pretty dumb. Dead, you're speaking to bones. I know you're hard up for a crowd, but come on, you know? But that's what God says. Prophesy to these bones. Prophesy to these dead things. Speak the words that I give you to things that you think are dead. Can you stop and look through the lens? God speaking to the people of Israel, Judah. Are there any dead things in the church? You know, we live in an area that once was a hot spot for revivals. Doesn't look the same today, does it? We are one of the least church places. We live in one of those areas. Some people might look at the church in our area, kick around a skull. Can there be life to it? What about your life? What have you lost? And I specifically, as I'm going through this message, the Lord is speaking. Maybe some of you have fallen into things that, that you can't get free from and you feel like your spiritual life is dead. Maybe it's sin, maybe it's not, but you feel dead inside. Prophesy to these bones. Speak the word that the Lord gives you to these dead things. Then he said, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. How funny that must have looked. (laughs) Thankfully, there's nobody around to, to laugh at him at that moment. Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Notice, not my words, hear the word from the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says. Sovereign, he's control of everything. He reigns over everything. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and will make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. You know, God could have simply said, boom, bring it back to life. And then all of a sudden it would just be right there alive. But you see how God works through a process? First, the bones come together. Second, you know, the the flesh, the tendons. And then lastly, the skin. And we're going to find out some more later. You know, sometimes when God has you speak to things that are dead, you're not going to see instant results. But you may hear some things begin to move. God has a process and a plan and a way of accomplishing something. Amen? I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So 
Ezekiel musters his courage and he prophesies. So I prophesied as I was commanded. So as he did what he was commanded to, he was being obedient, right? What is God calling you to do that may be crazy in the eyes of the world, but you're doing it in obedience? So he prophesies. He says, he looks at those dry bones all around him, and I want you to see it in your mind's eye. Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. The sovereign Lord says, I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you. Let's first of all stop right there. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. And as he said those words, there was a noise and a rattling sound. Now just imagine, this is a little picture of what uh, the rapture is going to be like. You know, the vulture took one piece over here, the, the wild animal took another piece over here, and then all of a sudden, before Ezekiel's eyes, as he's prophesying those words, the Lord's going to make breath come into you, you're going to come to life, these bones begin, and they come together. You see that head? I don't know about you, but I think I might fall down at that moment. <laughs> I might stop prophesying. Imagine seeing that, and he's not just seeing one, a valley full of these bones all together in skeletons. Now, I want to be uh, honest with you for a moment. I so bad wanted to buy a skeleton to bring today. <laughs> they had one at Big Lots, and it looked so nice. I was going to set it here, but I couldn't justify spending 35 bucks. I'm sorry. You just have to picture it. So he prophesies, and all these bones begin to come together. There's that rattling sound. Can you hear it? And the bones come together bone to bone. He continues prophesying and saying, I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you. And as I looked, tendons and flesh appeared on them. He continues, and cover you with skin. And there before his eyes, the skin covered them but there was no breath in them. That kind of reminds me of when God created Adam. You know, he's, he's there, completely made, but he is lifeless, and God breathes the breath of life into him. So then the Lord spoke to Ezekiel and said, Prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to it, This is what the sovereign Lord says. So now he's not talking to bones. He's talking kind of to the air, to the wind. <laughs> Come breath from the four winds and breathe into these slain that they may live. Now let's stop. I'm going to talk about that, the four winds in a minute. But let's, we find out something about these bones in this verse. What do we find out? Hmm? They were killed. They were slain. And so... Most likely, these are the people, you know, when the Babylonians came in and destroyed the people of Judah, Israel, you're going to have battlefields. And in those battlefields, people die and they are left there. Babylonians come, strip off anything of value, and there are left the people right there. They are the slain. We find out these people that Ezekiel is prophesying to are the slain. Now let's go back. Come breath from the four winds. And so you're, you're thinking to yourself, well, when there, when there, when there, when there. What in the world is, why is he prophesying to the four winds? What, what does that mean? Now, a lot of different commentaries have some ideas about this. This is personally what I think uh, is the best description for it. Take it or leave it. You know, when the Jews are taken captive, they're called the, the diaspora. They are spread out. And so in this instance, he is calling back the people. And we see that from elsewhere in Scripture. He's calling back from the four areas. He's calling back from all here and bringing them back. This breath represents the soul. Come breath from the four winds and breathe into these slain that they may live. So that's what he does. He stands and he prophesies as the Lord commanded them. And then breath entered them. So let's go ahead and do that right now. 
Come breath from the four winds and breathe into these slain that they may live. And then all across this valley, these lifeless bodies, you begin to see their chests expand and breathing. Wow, that's pretty scary in that moment. Pretty amazing. So he prophesied as the Lord commanded him, and breath entered them, and they came to life. But that's not the end of the story. There's more to that verse if you're reading. And they stood up on their feet a vast, what? A vast army. You mean that that these bones that were dead, that they're actually now a living, mighty powerful, vast army? You bet. Then he said to me, so God is interpreting this vision that he is seeing, the things that he's allowing him to experience. God is interpreting this for him right now. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. Okay, remember, this is one of our lens. This was written to the people of Israel. They say, our bones are dried up, our hope is gone, we are cut off. I want you to put yourself in Israel's spot. There are people who are brought out of their homeland, they're in captivity. Again, Daniel, Hananiah, Azariah, Mishael are part of that, Ezekiel is part of that. They are separated from their homeland They know what has happened in their homeland. The temple has been destroyed. People are slaughtered all over the place. Some died from famine. It's a terrible scene. And they're like, there is no hope for us as a nation to come back from this. We are cut off. We're not even near our place. We're cut off from them. We're separated. There is no hope. That's lens number one. What about lens number two, the church as a whole? Do we ever look and do we feel like, oh, the church is going downhill? There's, there's no hope. We just got to hold on as long as we can in this life. There's hope. How about for your life? You may feel like it's blown completely. There is no hope. You feel like maybe you're here and you even feel cut off from God today. You can apply this to your life. So God speaks to Ezekiel and says, Therefore, prophesy and say to them, This is what the sovereign Lord says. So no longer is he speaking to the bones. Now he is going to speak to the people who feel like there is no hope and they are cut off. My people, and I I want you to place yourself in Babylon with the people of Israel that are defeated. They feel like all hope is gone. The temple is destroyed. There is no hope whatsoever. And I want you to see Ezekiel going to groups of them and getting them together. Hey, guys, can you come together? I've got a word from the Lord from you. And he begins to speak to this. My people, this is what God's saying. My people, I'm going to open your graves. You feel like you're dead. I'm going to open your graves and I want to bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Imagine the hope that comes inside of them. Is it possible that we could come out of this grave and that we could actually inherit Israel again? Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord. Why did they have to leave? They forgot that he is the one true God. They served other gods, and now they were brought away. But they're getting back, and as they come back, they realize that he is the one true God. You will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from them. It doesn't stop there. Oh, I love this. I will put my spirit in you, and you will live, and I will settle you in your own land. Now, in that, we see... God breathing life into them. But remember where they are. They're spiritually dead. No hope. God breathes His Spirit into them and they come to life and they inhabit again their homeland. And what do you think about when you see this? In the last days, God's going to pour out His Spirit upon how much flesh? All flesh. 
the Spirit of God coming inside of us and the power. I will put my Spirit in you and you will live. I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken to you and I have done it. It wasn't the battle to take back Israel. It was, God, I have done it. I think about uh, the scripture, not unto us, not unto us, but unto your name be the glory, honor, and praise. Right? He deserves the praise. He is the one who has done this. Would you stand up where you are right now? I want you to bow your head, close your eyes just for a moment. And we know what God did. God brought the people of Israel back to their homeland. We are seeing that today. But let's look through the other two lens. What about the church of today? What about our church right here in this area? What does God want to do? You know, there are times that I'll be real and transparent with you. You know, there are times that that I can get discouraged. There's things that I want to see. There's times that I feel like I'm kicking a, a skull around. Maybe you've experienced that before. But God wants to breathe life. Not just into this specific church. He wants to breathe life into his church as a whole. His bride. And we're really brought back to a question. And it's the title of the message. Can these bones live? Let's make it real. Can Cross Point Church Assembly of God live? prophesy to it can the church in northern New England that was once on fire for God but now is in decline churches falling off left and right we're asked the question can these bones live yes God if you say it Lord They can. The church as a whole. I think of China where people are being persecuted for their faith. Left and right. All all around the world, the church is being persecuted. Can these bones live? Yes, they can thrive. If you speak it, Lord. Let's go down to you. What have you written off as dead in your spiritual life? Have you lost the passion and zeal for God? Do you forget what it's like to have the hand of the Lord upon you? Do you forget what it's like to be led by the Spirit of God? To be used to do great and mighty things for Him? Maybe you're kicking your own skull. You feel cut off. And God asked you the question today. Can your bones live? Prophesy. Speak under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God. Can you just pray for a moment? As the Lord is leading you, I just want you to call out. Call out to Him. Oh, Lord Jesus, come, Holy Spirit, we need you. Come, sweet Spirit, I pray. Come in thy strength and thy power. Come in thine own special way. Lord Jesus, we need you. We've walked... We felt the bones beneath our feet. Oh God. We look and we say, is there hope? 
Remind us of who you are. Give us the faith and the boldness to speak your words, whether it be to ourselves, to the church as a whole. Lord, speak to us. Use us. Just a few moments, we're going to play the song that we we started off with, Come Alive. But before we do that, I want you to begin to to talk to the Lord. Is, Is there something that the Holy Spirit of God is speaking to you? Don't just listen today. Obey. Speak what He commands you to speak. Do what He commands you to do. Share with Him your your longing for His presence and to be used by you. I want to ask you a question. When you look, what do you see? Do you see bones or do you see a mighty army? When you look at the church of God, do you see bones or a mighty army? When you look at Cross Point Church Assembly of God, do you see bones or a mighty army? When you look in the mirror, Do you see bones or do you see yourself as part of a mighty army of God? Lord, breathe your vision over us. May we see who you have called us to be. You have poured out your spirit on each and every one of us. You live and reign inside of our heart. We are more than conquerors because of you, Lord Jesus. You have called us to be salt and light. Lord, you've called us to make a difference where you have placed us. And Lord, I thank you. I see in the Spirit all across the mountains, all across this area, little lights shining bright. That's what you've called us to be, lights shining right where you put us. You put us there for a reason. Lord, no more hiding it. Lord, May we stand strong. Be the light that you have called us to be. Lord, we come against any discouragement. And we pray life again, Lord Jesus. Fire, passion, desire for you, Lord. And we thank you in advance for what you're going to do in our hearts. We thank you in advance for what you're going to do in this church, Lord Jesus. We thank you in advance for what you're going to do in this church in northern New England and around the world. Lord, may you advance and may many come to you. And we pray, use us, Lord Jesus. Remind us of this vision. Help us stand for you. Amen.